Good morning. It's a ple uh, pleasure and an honor to be here. Hopefully I can keep you entertained. Some of the context of this is I had one DARPA PM tell me I'm crazy. I had another DARPA PM tell me I have thought about things they have never even considered. This talk is kind of related to those topics. Uh, in essence, I want to say you're kind of doing it wrong when you think about three dimensions. And I want to talk about what this could enable that we're not currently thinking about. But before I do that, I want to put in some context. I'm going to start by talking about memory, DRAM. As we all know, we live in a very complicated world. It's multidimensional, 3D and generally higher, like video 4D, 5D, when you start adding multispectral information. But at the end of the day, if we're going to do any kind of computation on it, we have to put it into memory. But memory is intrinsically a two-dimensional structure. It has arrays. It has banks. We access this in different ways. But despite the fact that it's a two-dimensional structure, we have spent a very long time pretending and exposing it as a one-dimensional interface. This dimensional reduction is actually a lack of opportunity to do something smarter and better, to get more bandwidth, to get better energy. You can see some of this with the next generation memory technologies, but at the end of the day, when we divide up our infinite linear tape into 64 byte stripes and stack them up and access them in random order, it's really giving up a lot of opportunity. In fact, in many systems, they become limited by integer arithmetic performance because I spend all my time calculating transformations down to one dimensional space. I'm going to come back to this later, but to move forward, everybody talks about 3D. We're doing 3D designs today, 3D packages. Is it really 3D? We started out with a monolithic design, and the designs got bigger, more complicated, more interesting, but they had everything in them all of the IOs, all of the compute, all the different kinds of resources other than DRAM, and that's why it was monolithic. For various optimization reasons, maybe it was performance, maybe it was cost, we started looking at polylithic multi-chip architectures. The interesting thing here is each one of these chips is fundamentally the same. It has all the basic ingredients in it. We just combine them together to make larger virtual monolithic systems. You could say, okay, that's getting interesting, and I've got some silicon band-aids to stitch this together with, but it's missing an opportunity. So what you're seeing now is polylithic tiled architectures, or I can say, wait a minute, my IO devices really want to be in a different kind of process. They want to be optimized to a different design point in the fabrication. Same thing for my compute. Now I can start bringing these together, or I can go all in on something like the Ponte Vecchio Data Center GPU AI platform, which has heterogeneous. Not only does it have memory, it has high-speed IOs for uh, InfiniBand-like fabric, it has compute, it has cache, but all of these designs I'm talking about, if you look at from a cross-section basis, you have chips stacked on other things and maybe I've got some memories or something in there, but at the end of the day, it's still planar. If you look at the far left and the far right, we've just divided that up into a lot of little pieces, it's still a planar architecture. So it's still planar thinking in how you're approaching this. It's not 3D. So, okay. What about really aggressive, cutting-edge 3D research? Uh, Sun Q Lim, DARPA PM from Georgia Tech, right, has been spending a lot of time looking at the notion of core folding. Core folding is just like you'd think about folding up a letter or something else. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some of my base logic, and I'm going to imagine I have a second wafer I'll put face down so I go face to face with the metal layers. I'll move some of that logic up to the top, and if I do this, I can shrink my distances and I get nice advantages in latency, energy, and bandwidth. Maybe I have some complexity in thermals and validation, but I can do some interesting trade-offs here. The limiting factor to how well this works are what are the vias I use to connect my silicon wafers? Because we have spent a lot of time optimizing those top metal traces to be very high speed and very efficient for communications, but the vias that I would use to connect these wafers are not. So you start to become limited by, is it a micro bump system? Is it a hybrid bond on a large pad? Is it a hybrid bond directly on vias? These are different trade-offs that you will manifest in your cost optimization and the final product you're building. But to roll this forward a little bit, you can imagine starting with a four core tiled floor plan. Obviously we do a much bigger course than this. But this design, if you blow it out a little bit, shows you the cores in the corner and you have uh, L2 cache or additional cache materials as well as the mesh stop in the middle. And this becomes now the floor plan I'm going to design against in a monolithic approach or even a tiled polylithic approach. The idea of core folding is I can superimpose a fold line. Imagine I'm gonna bring on that second piece of silicon, literally fold it over and now put it together as two layers. If I take out the silicon so you could see it top down, 
you get this lovely shrink in the x-axis. My distances are shorter, my bandwidths have gone up, my energy has gone down, everything looks like a win, and I can keep doing this folding. Really aggressive methods of using AI or brute force simulated annealing reinforcement learning to try and make these core folds more and more tight. Because what I'm showing you is a cartoon concept. I'm doing a clean intellectual fold. When you start folding execution units and register files in the mesh all together into a very dense arrangement, you basically wind up with a unicorn, right? No one can understand it. Most importantly, because I've split my functional components across two layers, I cannot test them easily as individual wafers. I have to test them as an assembly. We don't know how to do that. More importantly, to make this work, if I'm really gonna go after the unicorn, I need something on the order of a million hybrid bond connections per square millimeter to support the cache and the interconnect bandwidth of the highest priority items. And I'm going to argue, even though this is technically 3D, it's still just planar, and we're going the wrong way. If I take two steps back and I think about the history of computer architecture and computing, I want to stop and think about what actually happens. We have a hierarchy of different components that come together to build a platform. Starting at the top, I have execution units. From the execution units into the pipelines and the register files, the near cache, the far cache, in package memory, out of package memory, legacy, a long list. But if I start thinking about what this pyramid represents, I can think about the capacity or the number of units per core or per computing element if it's not a core but a GPU or an AI accelerator. I can think about the energy in picojoules per bit that I experience in using different levels of the hierarchy. I can think about the bandwidth required to keep the higher level sustained operation running. And I can think about the latency up and down the stack as I move from the closest elements to farther away. What I would posit, conjecture, is that the real opportunity to pursue 3D is to look at the order of magnitude division crossings here because there's something important. Instead of brute forcing core folding, instead of doing other particular attempts, I can look at these transitions and say, I've already designed an architecture with a bus. So instead of trying to fold the core, maybe I should start folding around the buses. It's a lot fewer connections. It's a lot easier to reason about. It's a lot easier to validate. So if we could use this as an idea of an abstraction, I could move forward and say, okay, let's keep this pyramid in the back of our mind, and now let's think about the future. And in particular, there's an interesting bit of trivia that you should be thinking about, is if we talk about the prehistoric era of 45 nanometer designs, you'd have roughly 80 square millimeters for a large big core. We talk about Intel 18A, and you're talking about how many cores do I get in a square millimeter? That's an interesting conversation. The point of core folding was to reduce those distances. But with Intel 18A and other advanced uh, fabrication processes, your distances are shrinking so dramatically, is it worth that trade-off? That's why I'm saying, is there a way to do this better? More importantly, you start to ask questions of, yes, I have done the polylithic approach to tune chips specifically for IOs, but should I also start thinking about tuning them for my memories, my caches? Maybe it's not economic to put large arrays of cache in the most current generation. Maybe I actually want to do a couple of generations old and start stacking these together like pancakes. And I could do this. This is, in fact, a whole lot of work. You saw slides today, all morning long, showing diagrams like this of different levels of complexity. But I have thermal stress. I have I.O. problems coming up and down the stack. I have power, ground, cooling. Right, there's a ton of issues. Oh, and I also have to interconnect. So this is where I come back to I need a large number of connections between my layers, and how do I build that in a reasonable way? My argument is if I go back to that pyramid of the hierarchy and I think about the inflection points where I have crossings in bandwidth, there's something smarter to do right now, and that's flip this on its side. If I rotate this 90 degrees and I think about the edges coming off my cores, this might be four millimeters, this might be 10 millimeters, it's fairly short, but I don't need a lot of I.O. pins off a core to get to a legacy PCIe CXL port. So I could put my legacy I.O. layer of logic underneath this. At the same time, remember we talked about memory as a multidimensional structure. In fact, with HBM, VH, and others, you actually have true three-dimensional structures emerging. 
I could put my high bandwidth, large capacity memory right on top of this compute. Because on a per core basis, by the attenuation of factors, I don't need staggering bandwidth into the memory. I need modest memory per core, per die. By rotating it sideways, I've also changed the thermal stress equation. I don't have tons of compute compounding each other. I have relatively cool SRAM separating them out. I could also introduce other thermal layers. But I can go one step further. I can put power and ground laterally through this stack. I don't have to get it off the bottom. You can imagine having a little brick of silicon with a car terminal battery on either side. You could do that. But more importantly, when I think about the future, I think about scaling to large systems, I want something like photonics or advanced RF. And if I take the notion of the cube and I think about these natural attenuation points, I can change this into a cubic 3D construct using six faces. And a side effect of this is I don't need a million connections per layer, per square millimeter, I need a thousand. So we've just changed the complexity model, but it's also easier to reason about or validate and think through. Why would you want to do this if this is crazy? Let me give you two quick examples. Uh, looking at the Aurora 2 exascale supercomputer coming online at Argonne National Lab, very large system, takes a lot of power, but effectively each rack of Aurora takes about 9.8 meters cubed if I did my math right. Don't hold me to it. Uh, but that's the entire space of the compute, the volume, the computing, the floor, a bunch of other things. And if I were to apply these techniques, I could shrink that rack, all of the silicon in the rack, to a cube of roughly 40 millimeters on the side. Over 100,000 X reduction. Imagine having a whole lot of petaflops and a whole lot of memory at an insane level of performance. There, I can't tell you how to cool it. I can't tell you how to power it. Right? That's, another, that's a DARPA hard kind of problem. Right? <laughs> but if I could build that stack, what would you do with it? Here's another one, take the Apple augmented reality headset, the Vision Pro that was just announced. A lot of the reviewers talking about it say, hey, you know, it's an interesting device, maybe it's a little awkward and bulky to, to wear, it's kind of where we think the future is going, but it's limited in lifetime by the battery and the weight you've got to carry on for the compute. A grain of rice, according to uh, uh, NIH, right, the average size of grain of rice using the same techniques, I can put all of the compute silicon in this and a half a terabyte of DRAM. So I want you to just pause and think about holding a grain of rice in your fingers that could do that level of compute, what would you do with it? I can't cool it, I can't power it yet, that's a DARPA hard problem. I don't know how to connect it to something, that's a DARPA hard problem. I don't design and validate, that's a DARPA hard problem. But you can see the applications that are potentials in front of us. So to roll this back, I'm gonna argue that by paying closer attention to what we've learned over the decades, relying less on brute force and more on a little bit of human cleverness. There is no AI system that can imagine doing a die rotation like this. It doesn't just have to be this way. Imagine you can make this a fractal design. I have interleaving toaster slices, pancake slices, and different geometries coming together in pluggable modules. This is, I'm going to argue, a far more intelligent and efficient way to build these things. But there are a lot of DARPA hard problems. There is no tool exists that can do edge polishing in these assemblies. It's not out there. We know how to do horizontal polishing. We don't know how to do edge polishing without destroying it. How do you do the right angle attach? Inductive, optic, electrical. But the densities, what's the right way of doing the densities? Different materials, different properties. I can't afford big drivers to do these. I need a very tight pitch so I don't spend all of my area with keep out zones from the analog design. My bonding speed, my time on tools, I can't spend years building up one of these modules. I need these modules built fast. How's the Z height I can handle? How do I do the wafer thinning? There's a lot of hard things in there. I didn't think about the power and the thermals. What I keep kicking out is, you know, Mark's problem of the future or Deb's problem tomorrow, right? Basically, what's the thermal density? How do you cool it? How do you get the power in? How do you take it out? How do you deal with the stresses that may arise, especially when you introduce heterogeneous materials to the assembly? From the EDA perspective, there's no language for rotated die. There is even no way to describe this right now outside of pure mathematics. How do we recognize the tapering of the pyramid and that we can do isolation of boundaries by looking at the taper points? Non-planar libraries. You think DFX and DFT is hard today? I've got a thousand dies or more stacked up in this thing that I can't test individually very easily. What does that look like? How do you do it? What's the scan chain time to bring this up? And then you think about the actual architecture. As a system architect, a silicon designer, I have to plan for the fact things are gonna fail in this and they have to keep working. I need graceful degradation. What does that look like? 
What does my interoperability story look like in a true 3D heterogeneous environment? How do I handle redundancy, right? Can I actually have pluggable modules in this, or is it you put it together and let it gracefully degrade through time like a, an EV battery? The level of abstractions required to pull this off are staggering. These are all open questions. But I would argue this is a better way of building it. But to make this future possible, we need to think about the solution in a cube and all of the challenges about rework, design, standards, and all the missing tools and flows out there, as well as all the prototypes that need to be built. So with that, uh, thank you for your time, and hopefully this was a great motivation. <laughs>